and welcome to this episode of Lerner Talk. Uh, my name is David Nygren and uh, I'm from Umeå. Umeå is a city in the northern Sweden. Uh, for about 10 years ago, I was starting, started a, Lern, uh, a community, online community with name lernerforum.com. At my side, I have Ruby Carrot. She is an author and an artist and sitting in Eureka in California. And on my other side, I have Alan Smith sitting in uh, quite close to London. I don't know how long, but close to London in the UK. And I think everybody knows Alan Smith. He's a well-known lender researcher. Uh, so over to you, Alan. Okay. I, I think it's my, my duty now to introduce the rest of the panel members, which is, um, of course, our, our old friend, uh, Lenar archivist and uh, friend and companion to many Lenar researchers, Jed Rothwell, who, uh, who stars regularly on Lenar Forum. Uh, he, he does like an argument. And also our very special guest today, Stephen Bannister, who's a, a historian, perhaps I should say, economic historian <laughs> and uh, principally an economist at Utah University and both Jed and Steve have done very remarkably good presentations at ICCF 24 in Mountain View California recently um, and uh, where Stephen and I had the pleasure of a long argument about <laughs> the, the enclosure acts but never mind that's another story um, Mm. I'll pass it back to Ruby now, who's got the first question, I believe. Well, thanks, Alan. Uh, thank you very much. I certainly did enjoy those presentations uh, that both Stephen Bannister and Jed Rothwell gave at the conference. And uh, if you're out there, you want to see these presentations, just go to YouTube and search ICCF24, and you can see all those presentations. But the first thing I want to uh, ask you both, uh, and I'll start with you, Stephen, you referenced in your talk, um, Energy and the Economy, uh, Jed Rothwell Cheap in referencing uh, breakthrough technology. What did you mean by that? What, what does Jed Rothwell cheap mean? And when you're finished, I'd like to get Jed to respond. Of course. So um, I, I, what, what I was referring to is a, a couple of things. First of all, Jed's paper of, I don't know, was it three or four years ago, Jed, you started that? Yeah, and I've got a new version coming, an uh, updated version. I can't wait for this. Um, a lot more detail. Great. Um, and it and I pulled, rightly or wrongly, I, you know, I, I generally don't pull facts out of, um, uh, you know, background energy fields or anything like that. So I read it somewhere or thought it somewhere. Anyhow, I, what I recall is Jed said in that paper, that it was the new energy available through LNR related technologies could be as much as 200 to 600 times cheaper than whatever we have right now. Yeah. And then with my macro background and research interests on energy and economic activity globally, first of all, I, I studied the, the English Industrial Revolution and uh, was very, I, I came to the strong conclusion that was an energy revolution, primarily, primarily. Mm -hmm. A lot of other things happened, but they were generally after the energy revolution. And um, knowing that and the strong correlation between energy inputs and economic output and therefore living standards. I mean, that's why we're all sort of rich now, except for distribution, you know, asymmetries. But anyhow, um, so I can convert that now. So an estimate of cheaper energy from this technology 
and to what it means for two important things. Uh, getting rid of carbon combustion fuels of all kinds. So oil, gas, uh, uh, wood, and uh, what am I missing? I'm missing one. Coal. Coal, yeah. Coal, coal's on the way out. Yeah. So those are the big ones, and replacing it with something clean. So th this th that those cost estimates help me with that, to estimate that, at least at scale, the size of it, potential size. Not necessarily timing. I'm, I'm still working out the timing. We don't have a good method there yet, but I'll work on that. Uh, so at any rate, taking the, that one of those estimates, whatever, whatever it ends up being, if it's significantly cheaper than what we have now, then we can estimate how much uh, how much the new, how quickly essentially, or not quickly, but at what scale will the new energy source replace carbon sources? One, and that's my primary interest for my research. But secondarily, the implications for future economic growth are stunning. <laughs> now, like second industrial revolution at, at much larger scale. So it's very exciting. And I, I really started quantifying all this at ICCF. So I appreciate, you know, the opportunities to, um, to share this with you. Well, Jed, uh, what do you think about his use of this uh, estimate? Uh, and uh, where do you think that's a pretty big range? Where do you think we're going to fall on that range? Well, it, it goes in stages. Start with a cold fusion cell. Uh, assume that looking at the cost of materials, the cost of manufacturing similar objects such as batteries, and you can begin to estimate how much it will cost. Uh, look at also the highest power we've achieved so far and assume they will all achieve that same level. Then, okay, what kind of heat engines are you going to use? Just assume that they will be the conventional mechanical ones we have now. Well, we know how much they cost. They, they sell thousands of, they sell millions when you include automobiles. So we can estimate the cost of those things today is 300 to $500 per kilowatt hour. The cost of an automobile engine used as a generator is $10 per kilowatt, uh, kilowatt, not kilowatt hour capacity, that is. So it's, it's, it's fairly easy to make a rough estimate of the cost of cold fusion after it after it becomes widely used, when when you start manufacturing millions of generators, uh, it comes in at about a hundred, two hundred dollars per kilowatt of capacity. Uh, then, when you develop more advanced heat engines, such as thermoelectric devices, things like that, the cost starts to come down some more. Um, the initial cost would be around twenty times less than today's energy. That would be 10 or 20 years after it's introduced. That's how long it takes uh, technology to become uh, commoditized, a commodity. That's what we call it in the computer business. Uh, computers were introduced around, personal computers around 1980. By 1990 or 1995, they, they, they were far cheaper. And they were also interchangeable. And the patents were expiring, so anybody could make one. That's what will happen with cold fusion. That also happened with the Model T Ford, 1908 to 1924. The cost fell and fell and fell, and then it reached the low point. It happens with a lot of technology. Uh, so anyway, that's after about 10 or 20 years, it will be roughly 20 times cheaper than today's energy. And then additional um, improvements can be predicted. And 100 years from now, it'll probably be hundreds of times cheaper. Uh, but that's the basis of the it's a very simple-minded analysis it really is i'm just looking at the cost of materials and we all know what generators cost because they sell lots of them already it's easy it's easy to project that that's all there is to uh, it. thank you thank you jed i think we perhaps we could go back to steve um you've you have talked and with great erudition if i might say so about how closely human living standards are related to the let's say affordable and available energy. 
Mm, yeah, right. about access to energy, going right back to the Industrial Revolution, perhaps before. And mm. you've also said the cheaper the energy, the faster, as, as Jedda said, perhaps, yeah, the cheaper the energy, the faster it will be taken up. Does Jed's modelling seem feasible to you? Does it seem possible that uh, uh, 20 kilowatt generators for $20,000? Yeah. Oh, no, 2000 by after 50, after 20 or 30 years, $2,000. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think the um, this, this is just what what is happening right now in the in Leonard community is just the beginning of, as Jed has pointed out, of a, a transition to much cheaper and some very interesting possible new energy sources. That will radically change essentially everything. I mean, everything. Living standards, especially, get rid of carbon, fuels, on and on. Now, those are two biggies for me. Um, so that's very credible. Yeah, let me point out that I wrote a, a long book about this, or a short book, Cold Fusion in the Future, um, full of ideas. And they're not my ideas. I, I stole them from other people. I talked with uh, the Arthur C. Clarke and mm -hmm. Eugene Malov and many others. And Put chapter after chapter describing the technology changes that might occur, um, but I don't take credit for them. I'm not an expert. I talked to an admiral in the British Navy, and many other people. So that's where all that stuff came from. So it's it's got a lot more credibility than it would if it was just me. <laughs> that's right. You you um, talking of the future? A clean planet in uh, in Japan have yeah. reported that they're testing a one kilowatt prototype. That's and, what they say. Uh, They've had. They claim that they've had an experimental unit running for over a year now. So, this is our um, this R and D R and D that we're talking about now. Cold fusion R and D is is contributing to their um, three hundred and fifty watt metal hydrogen energy system as well, which they're due to release in twenty twenty five. This could be the beginning. Let me ask both both of you. What more do you think about this commercial effort? People like Clean Planet. And do you have any details? Of, do, you, do you know anything about what that might cost? Because I have no idea. They've been a bit coy. But Jed speaks Japanese. He gets more, <laughs> he gets more scuttlebutt than me. No, I haven't heard. Uh, it, it, does not, it, it does not need palladium, is my understanding. As long as you don't need precious metals, the cost will be very low. Uh, ordinary batteries use lead, and they're, they're very cheap. Uh, and this gadget would have to be for to to, uh, to to generate electricity for a house. You need about 20 kilowatts in the U.S. or Europe, which means you need 60 kilowatts of heat. You can look at the prototypes and the diagrams and whatnot they put out, and you can estimate that the gadget would be uh, uh, be the size of an air conditioning unit. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really not that. Much. I mean, the external central air conditioning unit. Not that big and not that expensive. The initial ones will cost a ton of money, $100,000 perhaps. But there's no reason why a manufactured object of that nature cannot come down to uh, two to $4,000 after many years of development. There's, It's easy to estimate that. And by the way, regarding timing, that's very easy to estimate because we know how long this stuff lasts. About 15 years is how much any kind of home generator or refrigerator automobile lasts. Once you start selling them, people are not going to want to buy anything else because it's so much cheaper. After 15 or 20 years, the power companies will be out of business. There's no question about that. You're possibly right, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, do, do you have thoughts on that, Steve? Sure, 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 sure. So um, let me let me sort of introduce or reintroduce my, you know, my the importance of energy in history. And the English Industrial Revolution is the most complete example, historical example. There are others, but certainly England sort of discovered um, the secret and let the genie out of the bottle, if you will. So, um, and I've made an estimate, uh, you know, a statistical estimate of uh, for the English Industrial Revolution of how much each energy input changes um, economic output per capita. So that's real living standards per person. And it's about, the ratio is about 1.54. So for every unit of energy you get, 
1.54 units of, of uh, economic output. Now, I'm sure that's changed over the years. And I have the data. I just haven't had time yet to redo it with a more, more modern data set. But I will. But just using that, you can see the impact, right? And my strong sense after more than a decade of doing this is that it is energy that's the crucial input. Everything else can be substituted away from any other input, essentially. Yeah. Energy cannot. Now, source can change, but you've got to have that unit of joule or BTU or however you measure it. you got to have that or you get no activity. So it's that's essential. Great. That's great. Um, by the way, I do think that Japan will be a phenomenal country in which to introduce cold fusion because they're so they're all early adopters in Japan. It's part of the national culture. And uh, in fact, uh, Mitsubishi have had tremendous success dishing out uh, little 500 watt fuel cells uh, that run on bottled gas uh, to places in the country, places in the town. And they just provide an emergency lighting circuit, a bit of hot water, and um, uh, enough energy to run a radio or a TV or whatever in case of earthquakes or emergencies. But people just buy them and use them anyway. They really like it because they, they see it as clean energy. Yeah, and uh, no exhaust and very just a little CO2. Very so me, That's a great, great story. I hadn't heard that. But let me take it one step further on sort of the economic side. So given what I just said about energy and economic output, um, we can estimate, and I, I maybe now's a good time to throw a couple of numbers out. Is that the right time, Ruby? The Alan? Right down. Yes. Okay. So, so, so uh, the energy EIA, Energy uh, Information Agency in the U.S., has an estimate of the price elasticity of fuel fuel source substitution, mm -hmm. right? So that's elasticity. You know, I hear elasticity and my, my ears start burning as an economist. And that in the long run, long short run is tough because you got to change infrastructure, as Jeb has, Jed has pointed out. But in the long run, their estimate is a one elasticity. That means for every oh, I don't know, 10% reduction in cost, average cost, you get 10% increased demand for that source, replacing presumably something else. So that's why I get excited because Jed's number, even 20, even 10, <laughs> what it, where we start, but at 20, that's what? a 2,000% decrease in the average cost of energy. Yep. And th at that rate, I mean, that's what I'm, tr I'm thinking about, how to estimate timing for, for, from a, a growth standpoint, you know, technology and infrastructure, how quickly that could happen. But I think it could happen pretty quickly. I think Jed is saying, you know, um, 10 to 20 years, I think you said, Jed, yeah, is that right? Like that. Yeah. After the after the mass production begins, not, not sure. from now. Understood. I, I understand. But also, what I know as an economist, the bigger that price differential, the quicker things will happen. Sure. That's yeah, and also, yeah, also, convenience is a big issue. Absolutely. The Model T Ford began to really er clobber the railroads, passenger railroads in the 1920s. By the 1930s, it was a crisis. FDR had to introduce legislation to uh, pension off all the railroad workers. Cars were cheaper than railroads, but also they were far more convenient and more yeah. beneficial, oh. useful. Also, if I may follow, just follow on to that story. Um, it may be apocryphal, but I think it's accurate. In the U.S., the um, replacement in, at least in urban areas, of horse transportation with Model Ts and you know other other autos yeah. took about twelve years. That's about right. My mother was at, at Cornell studying economics in 1938, and the professor there said that the 
depression was caused by the replacement of horses by cars. <laughs> and he said that the, the peak was 1920. 28, the same as the depression started. Uh, the peak of ho the horse population, that is, for the entire right. country. And by the 30s, of course, horses were becoming quite rare in most places. Oh. This is so interesting that we can see from the history and think about what will happen in the future. Because, yeah. sure. Can we go over to the next question? Sure. Uh, this is another type of question. Uh, we know that uh, war is all not always but often connected to to minerals or to energy or to this stuff uh, and this question we need to zoom out a little bit and what do we think about the war in russia connected to U ukraine if if we have a breakthrough can something happen oh i don't think it's over energy russia's got tons of energy they they don't need and they're not fighting for energy maybe for the grain but not uh, no but they no, are using no, it but, as a weapon, of course steve energy is a weapon in the in exactly the, they're using it you know as a oh yeah sure negotiating chip and threatening europe essentially with cutting off energy supplies sure. to try to gain that that leverage and advantage so over history again Resource contention, you know, fighting over resources, especially including energy and oil and so forth, has been a major driver in geopolitical changes, including wars. I mean, sure, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor because they were because the U.S. cut off their oil. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, You're a good fire. historian, an excellent <laughs> yeah. And there are some. Um, reports, I think very you know, well done, that World War I was fought essentially over coal. Yep. And and that's credible to me. And it, so this is not, I mean, this is not unusual. So, you know, the other benefit of going to Jed Rothwell Cheap, I hope you don't <laughs> mind me repeating <laughs> that. Appreciate it. Okay. It, it, you know, you, you sort of get rid of those those uh, irritants in the international system. And that's a big deal. And, and I should say very briefly, the, the implications beyond, I mean, all the social economic system e implications of such a change are gonna be very dramatic. To me, unpredictable, but they're gonna be huge. Yep, the technology changes, we can predict many of them, but nobody can predict them all because, well, to give an example, we all knew that computers were coming on rapidly in 1980, but not many people realized that they would change uh, hotel doors or yeah. bath, you know, bathtubs or, or kitchen gadgets or phones. You know, or, you know, phones. Actually, that was somewhat predicted by Arthur Clarke. But yeah. the point of it is that it, it, technology always affects much more than you expect. Fundamental technology uh, changes always go much farther than anyone realizes at when they begin things like railroads and automobiles had a profound impact on the the whole landscape of the US so so just real quickly you know following on to, to Jed there the, the my estimate and it's rough I could improve but it's good enough for now the industrial revolution and everything that followed on caused essentially an eight time increase in global living standards uh, Jed Rothwell Cheap will start at 20 times. Mm -hmm. So you can expect over time for two and a half or three times the uh, impact on the global system from an economic standpoint and living standards, which is what I focus on. Well, you going know, back when to I the hear these numbers, um, <clears throat> I think about how vastly different things are going to change. And I wonder about how our use of these numbers will change. We know how money has changed and the value of money has changed. Do you think when we get to a point where our energy is Jed Rothwell cheap, that we could 
actually live without money, like in Star Trek? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I'm doubtful. <laughs> when you, I mean, I I know uh, it's not quite my specialty, but I know quite a bit about the history of money and money in one, some form or another goes back well at least to um sumeria so that's what ten thousand years ago if and, you're not spending money on energy you're going to be spending it on something else and you need right. a standard to compare ex apples to oranges right. so you know which which ones are more expensive and, and, and some people have actually proposed using energy as as that standard the numeraire in the well, Arthur Clark. <laughs> Was it Arthur? That did well, that? he among other things, he he pretty he said. I, I, I'd miss it. I got to read your book now. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, I, it was in one of his books, okay. but he didn't anticipate the, uh, the the cost of cold fusion fuel over per year is about the same cost as bubble gum. Literally, it's a couple of dollars at most. The average cost of bubble gum uh, in the U.S. is that, so essentially energy will will drop. There'll be no need for a Department of Energy or anything else. I'd like to point out two other important aspects of this. First, it does not require a distribution infrastructure of any sort. Right. You just put it into the engine when you do when you make it, and take it out when the engine is scrapped, like like a battery, like the acid in a battery. And and second, uh, it's it can be decentralized completely, which which means everybody can have their own source, which means you don't have to have a power company, and it also means the Russians can't possibly cut it off. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. There's no, that you can't, it can't be used as a weapon at all. Those are some of the huge institutional changes we're going to face. Yeah, yep. truly. I mean, so. Um, Absolutely, and and a whole change actually in the in the revenue base on on which yeah. government depends. <laughs> sure, uh, the, the the UK government, let's it you know gets several hundred billion a year from taxes on on gasoline and and uh, gas and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a, and, and taxes on the companies that produce it. Uh, it's going to be a big hole in their revenue when we don't need <laughs> that anymore. Mm. Perhaps we'll move to an age of smaller government, but more well, benign and more equal. Governments than. are usually very creative in levying taxes. So yeah, they'll find something to tax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Opinions, probably. Yeah. <laughs> they have a tax on opinions. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> is there anything else ruby that uh, comes to mind uh well i just want to thank uh, both of you for coming on and talking uh, about your speciality and um i hope everybody goes to the youtube uh channel search iccf24 solid state energy summit and uh, watches these videos. Uh, Jed Rothwell has a number of computations that estimate the various costs uh, as we move forward in this uh, breakthrough economy. And uh, I know I've got to listen to it uh, five more times to get it all. So uh, thank you both. Uh, for well, I'm, I'm writing a paper. You don't have that. to look at the videos. I'm, I will soon upload a paper with all of the calculations and, and many others. <laughs> That'll be great. great. So if, great. If, if, do we still have a little bit of time? Because I have a couple of other oh, additional thoughts. Please do. Go of for course. it. Yes. Of course. Yeah. So, you know, I think. Again, I think the uh, my thoughts here are first of all that that the um, we haven't made greater progress in L A and R in at least in terms of commercializing it yet. And we're you know there's a lot of tantalizing ideas out there, and I think that's a partially a lack of funding for, for the underlying research. And I compare the, you know, L and R funding to something like hot fusion funding, which I think I probably raised some eyebrows at, at ICCF saying, that's not going to work, folks, for science reasons. I don't want to go into that right now. It gets pretty technical, but they're using the wrong science, so it's not it's not going to work. And 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 that, but that's just emblematic of any uh, other replacement. For carbon 
has a higher cost. It's going to raise the average cost of energy. Virtually every scheme is like that. Hydrogen, unfortunately, the same way. And um, therefore, this is what's so intriguing to me about LENR, because it can be uh, initially very cheap and getting cheaper through time. So it is um, a very promising start. I think there are other technologies beyond, well, maybe not beyond LENR as we continue to evolve the definition, but um, you know, I, I'm very fascinated from a future source standpoint with the what I call the direct electricity technologies. Yep. And I think uh, George Eagley um, is headed in that direction, maybe a few others, but that's an intriguing thing. I, I've actually, I'm aware of a device that works commercial in Mexico, of all places, that appears to be that. You know, it's just a chip two-time multiplier, input to output. And I'm going, well, why don't we develop that? But let's, let's if, if, if we can get enough funding and momentum behind LENR research to get it commercialized as soon as possible, that will be a huge, enormous step. And I'm actually beginning to gather ideas, funding ideas from the academic side which is where I, you know, sort of live on, on how to try to accelerate that. So I'm, I'm beginning to do a, starting on a proposal to the National Science Foundation, very much along these lines. And I will be reaching out to you folks as part of that, uh, as it goes along. I hope that's okay. That's great. Well, I'd like to point out one other thing that's sort of semi-technical aspect of this. Uh, the, Model T Ford came along and it began lowering the cost of transportation. And then they began inventing all kinds of what you call peripherals, better tires, better roads, mm -hmm. uh, ch cheaper gasoline. The The core technology was, was the internal combustion engine, but it gave rise to a whole, ga uh, many, many other things that pushed the cost down over the next 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. The personal computer began with the CPU chip, a one chip computer. 1975, I think, but that's not why computers are so cheap. It's not just the CPU chip. That's the core technology. But after that came along, they began inventing cheaper hard disks, cheaper screens, cheaper printers. All the peripherals began to go down in cost. There would be no point to building a cheap printer when CPU, when computers still cost 20,000 bucks a piece. That would be, there's no market for that. Cold fusion being the core technology when that gets cheaper, it 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 spurs the per, uh, invention of many other technologies, uh, heat engines and many other things, uh, refrigerators, thermal refrigerators. I mean, ones driven directly by heat, and a whole host of other things. And that's why the cost comes down so much. The core technology gives a market opportunity for other things to come along, and that's what drives the cost down. That's why it takes so long too. Absolutely. Amen to that. And as far as research donations uh, go, you know where I live. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think we're about ready to wrap up, are we, Ruby? Yeah, thanks so much. Um, uh, David, do you have uh, any final thoughts? Uh, I just need to say thank you so much. So nice to have you here, both of you, or all five. <laughs> I need to say. Uh, so, uh, for more information about the traffic, about Lenner, you can go over to lennerforum.com. And if you want to stay updated, you can follow the newsletter. If you sign up at lennerforum.com, you can get a newsletter one time a month with the, with the most important parts. So, thank you so much. Let me, let me just say, I... I hope I have a chance to at, at the next ICCF um, to, you know, have a, a more developed estimate based on Jed Rothwell Cheap, and I'll, you know, he'll be my co-author on this <laughs> presentation. Okay. So well, yes, thank you so much. I look forward to that. It's all right calling it Jed Rothwell Cheap. Just don't get it the other way around. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.